It, tonight is a very special night for us. We have Chez Gas here, and we're really excited to hear him talk about his work. He's an American painter and sculptor known for capturing the essence of the universal human spirit. His creations, char characterized by their rich textures and vibrant energy, resonate with those who encounter them on a deeply personal level. His journey as an artist traces back to his childhood connections with nature and spirituality, guided by his parents. Overcoming inner, inner city distractions, he discovered his passion for visual arts and embarked on a creative path that eventually led him to New York and Paris. I hope you had a chance to experience uh, the presence of the 10th downstairs in our collection study center. Um, get his art his art really drives, um, I feel like it's driven by purity and excellence, and he trusts his unique voice to express a story for humanity as a whole. Guest's artistic prowess has earned him a place in, distingu in distinguished spaces with notable figures like President Barack Obama, Oprah Winfrey, and he also had Gordon Park sitting before him for a portrait. Chaz Gass' goal is to foster inclusivity, respect, and pride through his art, aiming to bring people closer together by reflecting their shared humanity in his paintings. His commitment to philanthropy, empowering children through art, further underscores his dedication to fostering unity and self-respect among diverse communities, ultimately contributing to a more inter interconnected world. So please help me welcome Chaz Gass. I was wondering where is that guy? I'd like to meet, I'd like to meet him. First of all, I, I, I like to express how happy I am to uh, have my first visit to the Midwest and to share uh, this night with you, with you all. So uh, I'm very happy to see you, and uh, let's get let's get started. I I've not written anything down. I'm going to shoot straight from straight from the heart, um, and uh, just be as truthful as I can. So let's start with um, this young this young. This young lad that uh, was born in Niagara Falls, New York, on the American side. We actually used to walk to Canada, pay a dime to go over to Toronto. That was, that was very beautiful. I kind of dated myself, a dime, <laughs> a real dime. And, um, you know, my father was a very interesting uh, character. Uh, he fought in World War II. And uh, he was a decorated soldier. And, you know, what's very interesting that he, uh, well, he couldn't buy a house when he finished uh, serving the United States. And he, my mom and my dad, they had nine children. And uh, his quest was to get a really nice house for us. <laughs> but that didn't work out. So uh, he moved us to, to uh, Niagara Falls, uh, where he was able to... Uh, provide better. I don't know, I don't know how that, uh, I don't know the ins and outs of that, but that's pretty much how that works. Now I'm sharing that story with you because if you've ever been to Niagara Falls, it's such an open space. There's nothing to do. There's absolutely nothing to do. Uh, my dad was a minister in church and my mother was a housewife. So uh, we were made to go to this church. Now, I'm not a religious person, although I believe in the higher force, but I'm sharing that with you to say that uh, when you have to sit in front of a church and you're hungry and it's long, it's a lot of hours, that's almost like being a monk. I have, my discipline had become extraordinary. I believe that it is uh, partly because of that. Um, now I say that to say that 
I wonder how this kid was able to focus so much on the little things in nature. Like I, had, like I love to look at ants and how they got along, uh, uh, formed their business. And it became so interesting, their mission, that I would actually disturb the line to see how they would gather back and find their business. You, you can't believe how deep in my mind that went. <laughs> and digging for worms for my dad to go fishing. That allowed me to put my hands in the earth and feel. Um, I'm mentioning those things because my way of painting comes from that level of focus. Um, and then in that, you know, we, we never change. What we, what we do, we evolve. Would you agree? You, you, you evolve. You really don't, don't, not a lot of people change. And I'm still that little boy who used to wonder, how on earth can you flip a switch and the light comes on? I would actually wait for the electric company to dig a hole and go and ask, how does this electricity work here in the street? And it flicks on in my house. So I learned about grounding. I learned about how electricity works. This is the same mind that I went into painting with. I, I, I delved into uh, bringing about paintings like, like the 10th the same way. Can I remind you that I'm making this up as I go along? <laughs> <laughs> so really bear with me. So I saw this painting again down, downstairs, and, and, and it just raced through my body. I, I loved looking at that painting again, because let me invite you to how, the, how it came about. You really can't see it here. You, you, you might have to go downstairs and really take a look. But this painting was created when they delivered the canvas. It was very, very huge. And I, have a, I had a little apartment in LA before I built my studio. And I wondered where on earth was that canvas gonna go? Wound up outside in my garage. And if you know, a show of hands, who knows Akira Kurosawa, the work of Akira Kurosawa? He's, a, he's an amazing, he was an amazing filmmaker. If you don't know who he is, please look at some of his films. I would suggest Ran or The Seven Samurai. Yeah, yeah, you were really, really, will ref, we'll, we'll, uh, reflect on what I'm talking about, what I'm about to talk about. And then you, perhaps you'll remember. But Akira Kurosawa, it was clear to me that he used a lot of nature to bring about his brilliance. I was forced into this as I created this particular painting. Because I'm in my garage and I'm painting and uh, it starts raining and I have to lift up the door for the light to come in. Now I have leaves and wind and rain and everything. And I was so cold that I cut out the glo some gloves and my fingers can hold the brush. And, and I had on something like these, these funky shoes like this. And, and so my feet were wet and I was wondering why they were so cold. So I'm saying that to say that I was actually in the element of nature as I was creating this painting. And I saw all of that when I revisited downstairs. And, and then I thought about how I came about the, um, the, um, the hues, the colors, the palette, we call it, the palette. And um, I always wanted to do a kind of, uh, okay, right here. I always wanted to create, or is it this one? Or is it upside down? Oh boy, look at me. Okay. I always wanted to create a, all right. That's okay. All right, there you go, right here. So I always wanted to, this is highly inspired by Kira Kurosawa. 
highly inspired. I, I always wanted to create my own palette. So the story that I started with about being in nature as a, as a kid. So I, you know, I've evolved the same kind of guy. Where am I going to find a unique, where am I going to find a unique palette? Well, I look to nature. So this palette that I've been able to garner is c completely from how the seasons changed. And coming up with this hue was just messages from nature. Like I would mix this particular blue you can't really find because it's five different colors. I see. I would use the... Uh, Yellow ochre, Prussian blue, ivory black, and titanium white to come across. That was the closest color that I could mix to look like the autumn that I, that I wanted autumn to look like. So I'm, I'm, I'm sharing it with you to, to let you know how how desperate I was to come about my own individuality as a painter. I didn't go to school. I relied on nature itself to help me bring these paintings about. So when I see this one painting, I wonder about every character that I was able to conjure. I wonder what his what his family is like, and, and what his mission is. And this one, this one gentleman here, this is in the 1800s, and I'm wondering, you know, what is he thinking? They're fighting the Native Americans who, who have done nothing to them, and they're pit against two peoples that are... Uh, uh, disenfranchised. And that created sort of a locomotive for me to just keep going and keep going and create. And as you can see, I'm now pulling in other cultures. Like this looks like to me a Japanese screen. So you see, he doesn't even have a, a place. But this is, let's see, right here, this guy right here. So he's kind of just there. And the gentleman on the horse. It's like a, a Japanese screen. And I'm sharing our likenesses instead of our differences at the same time. Okay, let me try to do this thing right here. Let's see if I can work this out. Bam. There you go. All right. Oh, yeah, that's so much better. That's, fan that's too fancy for me. All right. And so, like, when I poured all of that energy in there, this is the one exhibition that I did in New York City at Vito Schnabel's gallery. Um, and um, as you can see, uh, I kept the same palette with this painting. This is a was a dear friend of mine. He, he passed away, uh, but he uh, wanted to be in the superhero movie that I've created. This is a Michael K. Williams. But um, he really gave me a gift before he left because uh, his energy and his... Uh, uh, was really, really a striking painting there. Vito's father, Julian Schnabel, actually put... Uh, Martin Scorsese on a FaceTime call with me. And that was really, really interesting to hear him talk about that. I'll never forget that. That's one of the highlights of my life. So this gentleman here, as you can see, um, my, I was desperate to bring him about to you. See, and I don't know if you can see what I see, but I hope that you do. I mean, He's trying to see a future, and uh, he is not sure, but he's going to carry on 
those are the eyes that I wanted to, wanted to create. And then from this, now this is all from this painting downstairs. This is, this is the, the train, as I mentioned, that the painting that's downstairs, it, it just created a, a whirlwind of uh, inspiration for me. So I decided to take some in, in, another inspiration from Akira Kurosawa's Seven Samurai, and I painted uh, seven soldiers with the character of every one of those Japanese uh, actors that Kurosawa so painfully chose. And I said, well, he did, he did most of the work because I don't know seven characters that I can actually find that w I would find interesting, that interesting to paint. So I just used these Japanese characters and changed them into these Buffalo Soldiers. For those of you who don't know who Buffalo Soldiers were, Buffalo Soldiers was an African-American regiment fighting in the uh, Civil War around 18, uh, uh, 1856. And um, it's worth Googling that if you haven't uh, any knowledge of them. It's worth Googling who the Buffalo Soldiers were. And also there's going to be a superhero that I've created, so that would be very helpful. So he comes out of the Buffalo Soldier world. And uh, this is one other character. We have that. So all of these guys, all of these soldiers, all of these characters, all these individuals, these characters, they have their own individual self. As I'm showing you these, I'm reminding myself that this is not academia. This is not academia painting. This is painting just the sheer uh, desire to tell you a story, to tell you a story that you probably don't know. Because here in our country, um, a lot of stories weren't shared. Uh, so it's almost like I could live a couple of lifetimes and not have enough time to paint what I would like for you to know, what I would like to introduce to you. So from these characters, if you can start to imagine who they are, their loved ones, their wives, their children, their aspirations, their dreams. A lot of people call them slaves, and that's easier to deal with. But these were enslaved people. Very big difference. Yeah, it changed the whole, changed the whole vernacular there, you know. A slave is easier to deal with. It's like a pig or a chicken. But when you, call, when you refer to them as who they are, as enslaved people, well then, that presents a whole another way of thinking, I believe. This is what I paint with. I want to introduce them to you. So this is a rendition of the superhero that comes out of the Buffalo Soldiers. And uh, he's called Buffalo Warrior. And it's coming to a theater near you. <laughs> Rated R. <laughs> it's going to be hitting hard. Um, I have a great actor for it, a great director, and we're, we're, we're ready to go with that. I'm very excited about that. And here he is, Buffalo Warrior. So I think that, that's that. I think that's that there, right? Um, what? Okay. So uh, where are we at? Help me out with a couple of, uh, you have an interesting question for me that I can get on track of what you want to hear. That would be great. Yeah, yeah. He, I, I'm very much aware, I've done a lot of extensive research, but we're gonna have him in Texas. We're gonna have him in Texas first. And that's where the story is gonna start. But, um, but, but by you asking me that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive deeper into that. And I thank you for that. Yeah. So, okay. What do we got there? So, so I named this um, talk... Uh, the art, the art, 
the art of uh, living. There's an art to living. Yeah. yeah, there's an art to living. There's an art form. There's a mysterious thing that happens. You know, I, I, I always wanted to be a, someone of somewhat importance in this experience of life. I was a gymnast once before, and I never made the national team. And uh, that was quite tough. Uh, and uh, so I had another try at martial arts. And I was fighting all around the world. Uh, that, that, that was satisfying, but not the very top. So painting was the thing that I had my last chance to go at. And so um, I went through that via fashion. I went, uh, you know, so it was the fashion illustration that it was. And uh, I took a one-way ticket to Paris. Didn't think about how I was going to get back. But I just uh, threw myself there. And I wanted the magic of what is to lend a hand. And it did. Uh, I... Uh, Helped a, uh, I helped a lady across the street with this big bag she had carrying across Rue de Rivoli in Paris. And I ran to her and I said, ma'am, can I help you with this bag? Now, mind you, prior to that, I uh, worked effortlessly. I mean, it was crazy trying to introduce myself to fashion magazines or anybody that would look at my work. It wasn't happening. I did that kind deed just because she needed help. I carried this bag to the hotel, I put it down, and she stood up and she kept standing up. <laughs> she was a runway model for uh, Yves Saint Laurent. And uh, she, uh, she invited me to a little champagne party in the back and there was one guy there that, that I visited his magazine. And uh, because he now sees me with these beautiful models, <laughs> he offers me to do the cover of his magazine. And I did the cover of his magazine and my whole life changed. <laughs> they send me over to Christian Lacroix. I go to Christian Lacroix and I did a drawing for him for this magazine. About a week later, it came out. I went back to Christian Lacroix after a week. I, I was almost in tears that they cropped one of the arms off of my drawing. And he goes, I don't think you should do this. I know that you are a painter. That was in 1987. So let me back up a little bit and look at how fantastic nature works. This is the art of living. Had I not gone out of that drive to do something and I step into my kindness and my thoughtfulness, of helping this stranger with this bag that led to this cover of this magazine that was in the metro in Paris, France. And they actually gave me a check. <laughs> <laughs> and I cashed that check and I got home and with the blessing of Christian Lacroix, I started an art life, training myself at the art store, Pearl Paint at the time in New York, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, at the MoMA, and I would just stare at these paintings and just drive my imagination. It's not always the academia. It's just trusting what we are made of. And aren't, aren't we a fantastic uh, makeup of whatever to make us these humans that are being? And, uh, and uh, we, we actually squander that. We squander that with this uh, ridiculousness of the differences between us. When yet, we're all the same. We have this pink computer, we have these eyes, and we have this nervous system, and we have this will, this will to love, this will to be included, this will to... Uh, to be recognized and just exist. And with these things, I tell you, with these things, we take with us, and the more you apply them, 
to what is, you will then begin to, to experience the art of life. It's invisible, but you have to trust it. I hope that's not too deep. I don't smoke weed, but <laughs> that sounds like a weed conversation. Uh, ask me a question. I have a mic here. Chaz, the uh, impasto in this painting downstairs is some of it's almost web-like to me. You know, I got right up on that painting and I looked at it. Mm -hmm. What the hell is going on, man? I mean, how did you, how do you do that? Mm. Well, this is, the, you, see, I think that the reason I told you about those worms and about those ants, I was trying in my own way to articulate patience. And that is just patience. I see a lot of other artists, they, they mix stuff, they mix wax. I actually want to feel the oil on the canvas. And I, and I move it around. And then the drying period is ridiculous. I have to wait a whole week. But during that week, I never wait. First of all, I don't wait. I'm going to take that. I'm going to retract that. I put that there very thick, and I'm on to another painting, a whole other idea. When that's dry, I come back, and I mix a medium called Stan linseed oil because that shines, and I want it to always be wet because I, you know, I bet if I went to art school, they would never tell me to do this stuff. That would be absolutely wrong, against the rules. But I want you to feel what I want you to feel. And I want you to feel wetness. I want you to feel freshness. And so I do mix that linseed oil into my, 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 my paint, and it works. I put it on, and it lasts forever. Um, I got to tell you, I did a painting of this one great drummer who played, played with John Coltrane. He was a good friend of mine, Elvin Jones. And the way Elvin would like work up a sweat playing those drums, he'd sweat so much. I remember dripping some Stan linseed oil. I painted that in 1987. You know it still looks wet. Still that oil drip. Right? That'll last forever. Yeah. So when you think of superheroes, you think of technology and mechanization and things like that. How are you going to pull nature, your ants and your worms, into your superhero that you're Placing in Texas, not Kansas. <laughs> I love that question. I'm going to tell you a little bit how about how that superhero came about. So my son, uh, Sion, I have two sons, Zuri and uh, Sion. Zuri's 20, 29, and uh, Sion's uh, 20. And uh, at this time, Sion was eight. This is when I, 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 I conceived this one idea of the buffalo uh, the soldier that will uh, eventually become uh, our, our superhero known as Buffalo Warrior, known as, right? And uh, so, my, so my son, you see, we were in the toy store, and it was uh, Captain America had a sidekick. I think his name is uh, Falcon. And uh, my son wanted a superhero that looked like him. You know, so he was looking for the, the black guy. <laughs> he was looking for Falcon. <laughs> and I didn't have any more Falcons. So I said, son, they probably made only 10 anyway. So they're fresh out. And my son looked up at me and he said, well, dad, why don't you create a superhero? And you cannot imagine. So my son at that time handed me the ink pen of history. So we get to do our own thing. We're not waiting for anybody else to do it. We're going to do it. And I saw through his 10-year-old eyes. And once again, when I talk about the art of life, I didn't rely on uh, the mechanical thing. and I asked nature to help me out. I went to sleep, and I woke up with this entire story. The entire outfit, the entire whole thing. And that is when you 
when you, uh, what is it called? When you can uh, culminate, when you can really, uh, you, you know, you start to mm, be more in control of this wonderful thing that we all have, but we, we can tap into it. You know, we can manifest things as human beings. We can actually do that. And that's exactly what I did. And so, um, so to try to answer your question, I'm not going to rely on that. I'm going to rely on nature itself, the way that things are. There was one actor that I really wanted to play him. He was just at my house two days ago. It was impossible to get him. He's very expensive. You'll have to wait and see. <laughs> He's very expensive, and he, we had dinner. And that is how my life is, and that is how our lives can be if we step outside and, and we trust the art of life. Yeah. Yeah, I love that question. Because, um, like I said, I was, a, I was a gymnast, and I threw myself into New York City in 1986. And um, so I tried a fashion thing, you know, and I wasn't enough money for me. I had expensive habits. I had a girlfriend that was a runway model, and she liked wine and cheese and chocolate and all of that. And I couldn't afford that stuff. <laughs> I, needed to, I needed to step it up. And so I, uh, I, I, uh, I got locked up in that because her vision just came to me just now. What's your question again? <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. So I remember, what, I remember around this time when Lacroix said, you know, you're a painter. Listen, I wanted to do what, what Salvador Dali did to me when I first saw his work. I walked into the MoMA. And I remember looking at the persistence of memory that melting clock with all of the ants on it. And the, I looked at that painting so hard that the security guard had to ask me, was I okay? Now, I wonder what that looks like. But I was leaned into that painting, and I, I, I was in it. And you know what I said to myself? I want to have that discipline. Because I looked at one little white dot on the butt of an ant. One of his ants, he put a little white dot, like, doop. I said, I want to pay attention like that. And then I went around the painting again. Look at how he, linseed oil. Remember I mentioned lin, linseed oil? Who did I mention that? To? Yeah, the linseed oil. I got that from Salvador Dali. Yeah, because he would mix a lot. You couldn't see his brush strokes. It was just sort of like buttery. And then... Patience and linseed oil. That's Dali. <laughs> and then, then I went over to Pablo Picasso. And I, he just looked like a dude's dude. That's the way he's painted. That's a guy's guy, you know. Strong and rawr, he just went at it, you know. That's how it started. And I was introduced to some African-American painters. One being... Uh, Romare Bearden, I love Bearden's work. Uh, I can I can also talk about like like when you when I when I mentioned nature lending its hand, I actually bought a Bearden. I didn't have fifteen thousand dollars, not at all. I don't even know where fifteen thousand dollars came from, but I wanted that painting that 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 aqua tint, and I got it. Yeah. And I study it. It's in my house now. It's been 20, oh, almost 30 years. No, 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 no. 20, like 20 years. Uh, very inspiring. And then I, as I matured, uh, my taste matured. And I matured into uh, Willem de Kooning. I matured into Cy Twombly, Julian Schnabel. I have the um, great... Uh, uh, simple, uh, not what do you call that, uh, folk art painters. Like I have a friend, Henry Taylor. I love his work. He, actually, we painted each other. I have a beautiful painting he did of me in my house. And uh, 
you know, good. But those early, the early, the early painters were, um, was Cezanne. I, you know, I had one teacher at, uh, when I was a, I was a gymnast at Southern Connecticut State University. And I started with kinesiology, which was way too difficult for a gymnast. <laughs> so I had to like quickly change. And I thought that, uh, uh, Physical education would be easier for me to matriculate through as a as a gymnast, uh, and uh, with that, I had one uh, class uh, introduction to paint introduction to painting. Nineteen eighty three. My professor's name was Dr. Howard Fusner. He looked just like the guy from Back to the Future. <laughs> Crazy hair like that, and this guy loved. Cezanne. Oh, if I can just tell him how much he taught me. Yeah, I just got the chills. I love this guy so much. You can one art class, one time ever. And he taught me mountains of information. Because he had an assignment where we had to paint, we had to paint, uh, I chose, uh, uh, what was, what was Van Gogh's friend's name? Gauguin. I chose Gauguin. And he had us paint one Gauguin painting four times using different hues. How can I, how can that stick in my head like that? This is decades later, but I will never forget the hues that I chose. Red, yellow, blue, and I did some gray. And I painted that same thing, the same painting. And then he introduced so many techniques in this one semester that that's, that's all I needed. And I raced after, uh, oh, Giorgio de Chirico. Yeah, de Chirico was the one who really set me off. Can you see that? Because that's the magic. I never thought of that at all. And all of these years, it comes back, and you're not even thinking about it. Is that not the palette of Giorgio de Tirico? That is just amazing. I never thought about it once. That's the palette of Giorgio de Tirico. Yeah. And then there is a, uh-oh, coming out of my shoes on that one. Uh, the, 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 um, Okay, the Chirico, and then, of course, straight across from the, the, the Chirico and the MoMA on the, on the wall, whew, just like there, is uh, Balthus. Balthus, I love Balthus. His, uh, gosh, this old man was just sexy. He was just a sexy painter. And, you know, I got to know his entire family. Yeah, his uh, widow, Setsuko, invited me to their chalet in Switzerland. And I got to see where he painted. Because she's uh, 35 years his junior. So he died in 2003. And Sessico is 80 now. And she, uh, she uh, invited me to the chalet there. And like, just like Dr. Howard Fusner, when I was in this chalet, chalet, then I went over to the barn where he painted, scores of information. I could, I could paint if, like, I could paint if I lived three times. Yeah. 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 Chaz, uh, a few comments. One of the comments I'd like to make is, I'm so glad you didn't have a prepared presentation because this is just fascinating <laughs> just hearing you speak from your heart. Thank you. Um, there have been African-American superheroes, of course. Mm. Um, the Cowboys mm. are an example. 14-year-old yes. African American yes. who were the original Cowboys, the real yes. Cowboys. Yes. And I just learned this within the past year. The inspiration for the Lone Ranger is a black man. Yeah, Bass he, Reeves. Yeah, he mm -hmm. he gave out silver bullets and everything yeah. else, just like uh, That's right. the Lone Ranger did. That's right. I just did a painting of Bass Reeves. It was a, a it was a, a private client, a private collector. I d I did a, a painting of Bass Reeves and my very good friend. You might want to tune in. David Oyelowo is playing Bass Reeves. Uh, so you might want to tune in to that. He's a great actor as well. And your question was? I didn't have a question, just uh, some comments, so thank you. <laughs> so um, 
Wait, I'm going to follow on that. Oh, because you reminded me the conversation, and he said exactly the same thing, believe it or not. Stan Lee. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and name drop, but Stan Lee and I had lunch. <laughs> Stan Lee, by the way, created all of the superheroes that we see today, Hulk, Iron Man, and all that, and we actually had, had lunch uh, twice, but in this one lunch, he actually said, I wish I created something like this. Because, yes, they were those superheroes that you mentioned. But this particular one is dealing with our American history. And it's going to be teaching everyone. It's going to be teaching European Americans who call themselves white people. I can't ever understand that. <laughs> this is a room full of European Americans here, right? And then you have, you know, he's going to deal with the Native Americans. And he's going to deal with the African Americans. And this is going to be fantastic. I can't wait. I'm so excited. Yeah. Hello, thank you for being here today. I yes. first have a comment, yes. and then I have a question for okay. you. They're, they're related. <laughs> <laughs> I was not able to attend the show when your painting was um, on exhibit. Mm. I was a little late today for various reasons, so I was walked in by myself. There was nobody downstairs except the person at the front desk. Mm -hmm. And I saw it on the wall, and I've got chills just talking about wow. it. It blew me away. Wow. It, it just truly moved me. Thank you. Bless you. With that said, and hearing how you paint, and you paint from your heart and from the earth, and you're so connected to these paintings. How do you let them go? Oh, because the world has so much to offer us. When I let one go, 10 more falls down. We're, life is very short, and we're taking nothing with us. <laughs> so I think you have made your presence known in this world and have... <laughs> done something special. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, Hello. I saw your painting I don't, a couple months ago. It was hanging in a corner, and there was a wall so that when one walks into the gallery, you don't see, you don't see the painting, what's in the corner. Mm. And I've been looking around at a number of smaller pieces. And I come around the corner of the wall, and just like she said, it was like, oh, my God. Wow. wow. Just so splendid and so powerful. Wow. And it reminds me of, or to me, it's like, in my mind, given what I've experienced and been taught in art history, mm. it made me reflect on August St. Gaudens' relief, a mm. giant relief of this regiment, oh. this volunteer regiment. Yes, yes, you know I know what you're yes. about. Mm -hmm. And in that piece, mm -hmm. the white commander is centered. Yes. He's on the horse. He's That's big. Right. He's leaning back reluctant. That's right. mm -hmm. And the soldiers are all like marching with great determination. Right. And each person's um, face is different. They're very distinct individuals, like right. what you're doing. So when I saw your, having seen that piece in person, and wherever it is, mm -hmm. Vermont or I don't know. Right. Um, I'm thinking, I'm comparing the two, mm. right? And your soldiers are going the opposite direction. Mm. The commander is absent. It's not, he's not even decentered. Right. He's not there. It's the not about him. It's right. not about him. And they're monumental. And it's showing the, sort of that chaos of battle that's actually in place. Mm -hmm. Not we're marching towards um, what was a pretty vicious fight for them, but yes. um, each one's again distinct. They're near, they're far, and what really struck me, and it's not even so like when I see your piece small. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm just going on and on, but it looks cartoonish. Yeah. So somehow to see you talking about doing cartoons, I'm like, oh yeah, of course. But when I saw it in person, the painterliness of it is so rich and so powerful and the gestures of it 
Mm. Good Thank job you so much. Thank How you. How much time do I have? Okay, I want to I want to expound on that a little bit. Because what you're talking about here, right? Is that when you're not taught how to do something, you see, there's no strings attached. And you get to explore what it means to be a human being. That's a, the gift. I think we live in this kind of construct whereby you're not even thinking for yourself. You're thinking about somebody else's idea. You know, when you think about racism, when you think about like how I grew up, I'm old enough to know redlining, I'm old enough to go, you can do it, but you can't do it. I've got all of these things. And it's sort of like, that's somebody else's idea. All right, think about it. What is it like if you had your own God-given brain and it, and it wasn't altered by anybody else's idea? How do you think we would be? Wouldn't that be fantastic? I think that would be fantastic. I want to keep painting, and if I live long enough, if I'm a 90-year-old painter, perhaps I will, I will be painting, I, I would have then painted everything that's inside of me, right? And then I could move on to a new way of communication. I think that that's what, I hope I live to be 90-something. Because that's going to be very interesting. Um, but right now, since we've been left out of the history, I've got to paint with reckless abandon and try my best to tell you another story. Yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Come on, we can think of something else. Come on. looking at this beautiful painting, I see so much forward motion. Mm. Um, they're all heading forward. And mm. hearing you speak tonight is really beautiful because I, I can hear that in your life. Um, just this overcoming of adversity, this moving forward into sometimes mm -hmm. the unknown and mm -hmm. just trusting the process that it'll get you there. Right. Um, have you always been like that? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a, I have always been a very strange individual. I mean, I think that when I look back, I try to tell my son's stories, and I was like, my goodness, I don't know where to meet you guys, because, I don't know, I, have, I was very strange, but uh, I, like, I like the guy that, that, that's here, you know, but, uh, I mean, literally spend a half a day looking at ants, because they were truly fascinating, but I found in the Bible, because I read the Torah, the Bible, the Quran, right? All. But in the Bible, it says, look to the ant. So I felt very holy. <laughs> I said, I'm on the right track. But can you imagine what's in the mind of these soldiers moving forward? And they're fighting a people they don't even know. They should be fighting the captives, the, 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 the landowners that, that had property over them. But they were pit against somebody else who's done nothing to them. So them moving forward is moving forward trying to establish uh, trying to establish a place. Just trying to establish a place. A place of respect, a place in history. It didn't work out so well. But um, that's them moving forward. Like, as I said when I started talking, imagine what's in the mind of this guy and his family, and his loved ones. That is, that, that, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll repeat myself, this is the locomotive that kept me going because I wanted to bring about their stories so badly, moving forward, moving forward. They don't know where, but it's just moving forward. Has your perspective changed from when you started painting? Perspective of what? Of the world. Oh, 
my pers- I wouldn't even have been a painter, but my perspective of the world would automatically change because you're probably, you, you know, I, I, I am a 62-year-old man, and in and, and life, every seven years is just so absolutely changing. Cells change every seven years. Yeah, you know, you're, yeah, things are always changing. But I'm gonna read. I, I like your question, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna t- tweak it a little bit. Um, and and he, he said, you see, what happens? A, a great musician friend of mine said. Um, he was looking at some of my works, and he said that. Um, so he said to me that my work has evolved so much, right? But for me. I didn't see that at all. So I think I painted way better back about 25 years ago. And you know why I said that as I took a, a, a deeper look? is because I was more desperate then. Now I'm smarter. And I'm more sure of my lines. And so therefore, you get to see something different. You get to see a mature mark instead of a, a really measured mark, you know? Like when I'm making lines now, they're lines of Rachmaninoff mixed with Mozart and Coltrane and Thelonious Monk without even thinking about it. <laughs> That's how that is. this presentation of African-American soldiers, and you've already discussed it several times, fighting for the man, fighting for, yeah. for the landowners mm-hmm. and everything else. When, um, did your father live long enough to see what you've done in terms of this? Because I know he had to have experienced when he came back yeah. from World War II and experienced the segregation that he yeah. was subjected to. Well, um, unfortunately, my father came back with now what they call, yikes, I talked myself into a corner, PTSD, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, he, uh, unfortunately, but what a, what, what, what a guy, my, I'm glad he was my father, but unfortunately, we couldn't live with him, and my mother took all nine of her children to Philadelphia, their children to Philadelphia, and, uh, so with my father, I had the, I, he got another family and that, that was a, you know, that was wonderful. That's what he, that's what worked out. That's how nature did it. So I, I, we, we had a relationship later on and, um, I'm sorry, I got locked into my own personal thing. What's the question again? Oh yes. Okay. So. Yes, I actually did a portrait of my father. So he did, and I introduced him to my son at the time, and he was three, now four. He's now 29. So my dad really got to see that, but let me tell you a quick thing. I'm, I'm, I'm always talking about nature because I believe that I'm a person that paid attention, that I want to be chimed in to something other than the way that we live this life. I want to know what the hell I'm here for. And I want to know how the universe is working with us. And I've gotten pretty darn close. Because when I think of something, when I want something, when I, when I desire it, and if it's, if, it's, if it's pure, if it's meaningful, the universe is going to give it to me. And what I got is my dad's story really fast. I want to share this with you. I was working on the movie script for this, and I needed to move the Buffalo Soldiers up to World War II. And I go, wow, my dad was in World War II. I know he would have a lot of information, but he had passed away. Two days later, I get a call from Ireland. This guy finds me on the internet, and he calls me, and and he's, he's writing a book he found me because he wants to know about this individual who was in the truck, Quartermaster 42. 
who had a confrontation on a bridge in Ireland, and he led a platoon of black soldiers. They were fighting the white soldiers. <laughs> they were supposed to be on another job, <laughs> but something else went down. And guess who was the, that was my dad. And he had the records, he sent them to me. Is it, would that happen to be your father? I was like, oh my God, that's Theodore James Guest for sure. And he filled in the whole part of how Buffalo Warrior would move and work all of that out on that bridge in Ireland. And that, my friends, is how the universe works. And that is the art of living.